Are you fully committed to your faith? How do you prioritise following Jesus in your life? If someone was described as being 85% faithful to their spouse, would you consider them to be truly faithful? No, probably not. Yet, all too often, we are complacent enough to accept Christian disciples who are less than 100% committed and faithful to Jesus Christ. And this can be as true for us as it can be for others. But why is this the case? What has happened within the Christian community to make such a lack of commitment acceptable? Indeed, all too often to make it the norm. Why is it that walking the road of Jesus, living out our Christian faith, is only something that we do when we aren't being distracted by things that appear to be more interesting to us? And I'm not simply talking about church attendance here. For following Jesus, the life of discipleship, walking the way, is far more than attending church. So how do we prioritise discipleship, following our Lord and Saviour in our everyday lives? Our reading from Luke's Gospel speaks to us about commitment to God, as well as the cost of discipleship. And in the reading, we hear Jesus speak harsh words. And it's easy for us to get hung up on these words, which in turn leads us to fail to move beyond their face value and on to their deeper meaning. The key message that that Luke shares with us and which Jesus himself outlines in his words is that discipleship is not a casual thing. It is not a hobby. It is not something to do when we're bored. Rather, It is a way of life. Discipleship is what Jesus calls us to, and we should treat it seriously. In that reading, three men encounter Jesus and are immediately brought face to face with the cost of following him. It's made clear from the outset what it means to take on the role and the mantle of being a disciple. Jesus wants us to be committed. Jesus wants us to be faithful. And he doesn't want that commitment, that faithfulness, to ever drop below 100%. The first man comes to Jesus and appears keen to follow him. He says to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. At face value, this man seems ideal. He does not place any barriers or caveats to his willingness to follow. He states that he will follow Jesus wherever he may lead. And then to our surprise, and most likely to the man's as well, Jesus does not simply welcome him to the party. Instead, he warns the man exactly what such commitment means. And he does so because to follow Jesus is no easy thing. There is no guarantee that all will be well in our journey. There is a promise of future glory, but the road that leads there, the road that we are called to travel, is not paved with gold. Not for nothing does John Bunyan illustrate this idea with the two contrasting gates. There's a wide and easy gate that many will enter because it appears attractive and it lures them in, but it is a false gate. Then there is a narrow gate that is difficult to reach and through which it is difficult to pass. But it is the gate on the path that Jesus calls us to walk and it is the gate that we should strive to enter. And yet, even so, despite the teachings of Jesus, despite the examples of many faithful people down through history, some churches and some church leaders claim that the Christian life is a permanently comfortable one. They claim that to come to Christ means to be blessed with an easy journey following him. But that is the wrong way to approach and to look at the Christian life. For Jesus himself never makes such claims. Rather, Jesus goes out of his way to explain that the life of the disciple will often be one of trial. Yet that trial is not something we should fear because we have the very best companion for the journey. 
And so here, to this man in our reading, Jesus explains that the journey of discipleship will not include the comforts that the man might expect or may be used to thus far in his life. A missionary society once wrote to David Livingstone and said, or asked, have you found a good road where you are? If so, we want to know how to send other men to join you. Livingstone wrote back to them, if you have men who will come only if they know there is a good road, I don't want them. I want men who will come if there is no road at all. Are we willing to follow Jesus, whatever the road? In the second encounter in our reading from Luke, it is Jesus who approaches the man. More than that, this time he calls him to follow. However, the man says that he cannot follow right then. He asks Jesus to allow him to go and bury his father before he comes along. The implication seems to be that he will follow, but he has something else that needs to be done first. Now, there are two interpretations found amongst scholarship, really, of how Jesus responds. One has Jesus appearing to be extremely harsh towards a willing disciple who has an unfortunate and unpleasant duty to fulfil. The other has Jesus dealing with a man who will make any excuse to delay what is required of him. In the first interpretation, we are faced with an uncomfortable response from Jesus. If we take the man's request at face value, then we are challenged, even affronted, by Jesus' demands upon us when it comes to commitment. Jesus is saying that there is nothing that should divert us from the important task of serving him. But an alternative thought that some commentators offer could lead us to consider that if the man's father had already died, then he would already be involved in the business of burying him. Therefore, as he is not we could assume that the father is not yet dead and that the man is simply attempting to delay his response. Others suggest that the reality of the situation is that the man's father had died a long time ago and the man was simply going to move his bones into an ossuary box, as was common practice. Perhaps these alternative possibilities strike a chord with you. But there is danger in adding too much to the text. We need to remember what is there and what isn't. It can be an, an interesting exercise to develop our reading of the text and build up a picture around it in order to help us understand what we read. But in doing so, we have to guard against perverting the text and making it say things that it doesn't actually say. And this is especially true with texts that we can find uncomfortable in the first place. The other thing, of course, is that if we do that, we can miss the point entirely when we set ourselves off on a tangent about a minor detail that really isn't important. The New Testament professor James Thompson says, interpreters who debate whether the man's father was already, de already dead probably miss the point of the dialogue. For Luke's primary concern is that the man placed conditions on his willingness to follow Jesus. Jesus' response indicates that the man did not recognise the urgency of the moment. In the second interpretation of that encounter, we find Jesus giving short shrift to this man who wants to bury his father, so he says, a man who pays lip service to the idea of following, but in actual fact he's not prepared to follow it through. Here we find Jesus seeing and knowing the truth about the man, and we're challenged that he knows us equally as well. Jesus is saying that he desires honest and committed people to follow him and that there is no place for pretense. The encounter with the third man has some similarities to the second one. This time the man who comes to Jesus does not want to bury his dead but simply seeks to bid well to his family before he heads off on the journey of following Jesus. And once again, if we take the man's request at face value, then perhaps we feel it's a reasonable one. But the response that Jesus gives indicates it is not simply a request to bid farewell. But there is an element of the man desiring to hold on to that which is of the past. You see, when we come to Christ and seek to follow him, we not only make a commitment, but we make a statement as well. 
That statement says that in coming to Christ, we make the decision to leave our past life behind. Not necessarily our family or our work, but specifically that which is not of God. We leave that behind and seek to move forward as a new person with Jesus. The trouble with the third man in our reading is that although he seems to have a desire to follow Jesus, he is not willing to leave his past behind and concentrate on the future that he has with Jesus. Instead, his old life still has a pull, a draw on him. And it's this that Jesus comments on. Looking back is not part of God's way. There are other examples of this in Scripture. Think of Lot's wife as they leave the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Think of the Israelites in the wilderness, again and again looking back, thinking that what was past was so much better than what was, th- what was coming. How much better it was in Egypt, they said. Oh, wasn't it wonderful back there when we were in slavery and getting beaten and killed and everything that went on there? Wasn't that wonderful? Much better than this and where we're heading to. No, 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 says God. <laughs> where you're going is the promised land. Where you're going is better. Where you're going is a future with me. This is where you should be heading. This is where you should be looking. This is where your focus should be. Yes, look back and remember. Use that as a powerful thing. That's why the Passover comes, to look back and remember year on year. Yes, we were slaves. We We were bound and we were set free. We look back to rejoice in what God has done with us, what God has done for us, but we move on with him. The key for each of us as we seek to be disciples is to strive to be as much like Jesus as we can. He has shown us the way. He has given us an example of how our lives should be lived in his service. When we turn to our reading from Matthew's Gospel, we find Jesus issuing a call to people who respond in an entirely different way to the individuals in that reading from Luke. These people, Galilean fishermen, are those that we describe as the first disciples. Their calling is described in some way in all four of the Gospels. In Matthew and Mark, it is the same uh, text, effectively. In Luke, it happens after they've been fishing, and in John, it happens after there have been conversations going on. And the important point that, that contrasts strikingly with our passage from Luke is that each of these fishermen just left not only what they were doing at that time, but their lives and their livelihoods to follow Jesus. And they appear to do so without question and without hesitation. They could not have known exactly what they were letting themselves in for. They couldn't have foreseen the road that lay ahead of them. They didn't know what would happen. Yet nevertheless, they saw something in Jesus that they felt they had to respond to. And they were willing to do so wholeheartedly and without reservation. The question for us is, are we just as willing to respond to Christ's call wholeheartedly and without reservation? This is an important question. For if we call ourselves Christians, if we call ourselves disciples of Jesus, then we need to be committed to him and to his ways. For to follow Christ is not a part-time occupation. Rather, it's something that is always with us and which challenges the way we live from day to day. And so what is God laying before you? What is God laying before us as a community? Because it works in both ways, that we're called individually to do things, but we're called as a community, as a fellowship of God's people to do things, to move forward with him. Where do we hear God's call? Where do we see his direction? May we each listen for God's call on our lives, individually and corporately. And may we be willing to respond to Christ's call, wholeheartedly, and without reservation. Amen.